Hi everyone, it's March 2nd, 2016. The time is approximately 2 p.m. Pacific, I'm sorry, 12 p.m. Pacific. And welcome to today's webinar, Overcoming Barriers to Creativity and Innovation, presented by Education and Business Programs here at UC Irvine Extension. I'm very glad you could all join us today. Thank you for virtually being with us. So to begin, full disclosure, this webinar session is being recorded and the archive of this session will be available within 24 hours. If you signed up for this webinar through the UC Irvine Extension free events website, you'll automatically receive an emailed link to this recording once it's posted, which again will be sometime bright and early tomorrow morning. If for some reason you don't receive that emailed link tomorrow, you can access the archive manually by going to uci.webex.com, clicking on the Event Center tab, and then selecting View Event Recordings. A lot of webinars will be listed, but simply search for the title of this webinar or the first couple words of it, which in this case would be Overcoming Barriers, and you'll find it on the list provided. But rest assured, the email will go out tomorrow morning, and the link will also be posted on the UCI Extension website on the Business Administration and Human Resources Program pages in the very near future. So my name is Daniel Powers. I'm a program manager for the HR programs, business admin programs, and a few other programs here at UC Irvine Extension. Today I'm speaking on behalf of my director, Angela Jante, and here's what we're going to be covering in today's webinar session. First, I'll give you a brief overview of the features of WebEx so you'll know how to submit questions throughout the presentation. And after that, I'll briefly give you some information about UCI Extension's business admin and HR management programs, which will be shameless plugs, but I promise they'll be quick. And then I'll turn it over to our presenter today, Marty Wardenberg, for the good stuff. And at the end of the presentation, we'll have a brief Q&A session if there is time. And finally, I'll reiterate our contact information if you have any questions that we did not address. If you encounter any technical difficulties during this webinar, please first take a sip of coffee as indicated on the screen and then send a chat message to UCI John and he'll help you to troubleshoot any issues you might have. If you have questions from Marty regarding the content of this presentation, please submit it in either the Q&A box or the chat panel, and we'll address your questions at the end of the session, time permitting. The chat panel should show up on the right side of your screen, and when you send a chat question, make sure that you send it to both host and panelist to ensure that I, as well as Marty, will receive that question. And you can also submit your questions into the Q&A panel, as shown on this handy slide. So let's talk real quick about a couple programs tangential to today's topic, the Human Resource Management Program and the Business Administration Program. The uh, HR program is highly regarded by local employers for real-world focus, immediate applicability, and most up-to-date information on HR practices. This program helps to increase your knowledge of staffing, compensations, employee relations, recruitment, OD, training and benefits, and much, much more. It'll also expand your awareness and knowledge of government regulations and teach you how to integrate new technologies into the HR function. This is designed for HR managers, assistants, trainers, recruiters, staffing specialists, and others. It's also perfect for managers looking to better understand human capital, as well as those looking to change career fields to the HR field. And also our business administration program, if that's more your bag, is modeled after a more traditional MBA program. It combines a series of courses that give you a solid foundation in basic business management, and you'll leave the program with the tools necessary to com competently and confidently face the demands and challenges of today's business environment. And this program is designed for a number of different audiences. Currently we have administrators and managers, assistants, trainers, specialists, as students, but the program is also perfect for managers looking to better understand their human capital, finance, marketing, purchasing, sales, in both the private and public sectors. If you're interested in either of these programs or the countless other excellent programs we have here at UCI Extension, be sure to check out our website for complete details. And speaking of our website, that's one way that you could enroll into our next session of classes. The next quarter coming up is spring 2016, and those classes begin right around the end of March. Uh, there are some classes uh, both online and on campus here at beautiful Irvine, California. 
And uh, you can check out our website for complete course meeting details for these classes and others. And in addition to the two programs I mentioned, currently in development is an innovation and product development program, which Marty will speak more about in this presentation. But if these programs have piqued your interest and you want to learn more, be sure to check out our website for full program brochures. You can also email me directly and I'll happily send you a brochure back. Uh, if you'd rather talk to someone on the phone when it comes time to enroll, you can do so by calling to uh, Student Services Office at 949-824-5414. And likewise, if you have any questions about financial aid, class locations, UCI policies, or if you just want to talk, they'll be happy to chat with you. So at this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn the presentation over to today's presenter, Marty Wartenberg. Thanks so much for being with us today, Marty. I'll let you take it away. Thank you very much, Daniel. Appreciate it. Um, this is the um, first course in a proposed program that I'll talk about a little bit later. The program is, involves product management, the entire gamut from uh, creativity and innovation, which is the introductory course, all the way through the uh, product development aspects of uh, coming out with a new product or service, through the uh, logistics and um, support elements of it and getting into the leadership of product development teams. I'll talk a little bit about that and this is the introduction. It's where it all starts, creativity and innovation. So that's where we'll talk about for the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes. And while we're waiting for the slide to change, the, uh, we have offered this program for many of our international students, and this is the first time we're offering it for our domestic students. Uh, we've delivered this to our Brazilian um, MBA students who come here in the summer, our French electrical engineering students, students who come here from uh, China. Uh, we recently did it for our Chilean and Thai students. So let's... Little bit of a glitch. It's not advancing, uh, Daniel. All right, let me see what I can do. One second. Okay. Okay. Do you see the next slide? Nope. It's uh, got the little magic circle going around and around, which is mesmerizing and yes. interesting <laughs> and hip okay. hypnotic. Okay, I'm seeing from our uh, UCI John, our helpful helper, um, that the slide did advance for, for viewers. So uh, uh, hopefully we can get it going for you momentarily. All right. No dice, huh? Okay, well, uh, let me tell you what people are seeing. They're seeing the overview of the creativity and innovation course, uh, okay. and, and basically the list of topics for today. What is creativity? What is innovation? And barriers All to right. creativity. Then I'll let you do the advancing, and I have it on my other computer, so I'll, I will go to the, um, the topics. So we're going to cover basically the course and talk a little bit about the importance of creativity and innovation. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the barriers. Um, most of us are reasonably creative, and some of us can even become innovative, but we face a lot of barriers. And I want to cover at least a few of those for you today so that you can get an idea of how, what we're going to be doing in the classroom. And then we'll talk a little bit about the entire program. So I'm going to, so let's advance it to the slide that says Creativity Innovation Course. Does, does everyone see that now? Yep, that's up right now. Okay. So the course itself is basically going to cover some theoretical aspects of creativity, how our brain works, and how to take uh, concepts in, in a, a shared environment with groups of people and take creative ideas out of our brains and get it up on a, a whiteboard and do things like brainstorming and other techniques to um, activate our mind so that we can actually be creative. Uh, it takes a little effort to be creative. It's almost like um, exercising. You've got to 
exercise your brain to, to, to make it become creative. Uh, we sit in our routine office in our cubicle and we're on our computer and the surroundings are very familiar. It's very difficult to move from routine to create creative mindset without physically doing something, physically and mentally. So part of what we're going to teach in the course is how to actually get ourselves ready to become creative. We're going to all get into the theory as well as do a lot of experiential um, work. We're actually going to be creative. We're going to, in class, this will not be a lecture type class. We'll cover the theory very quickly and then spend most of our time actually doing things. Um, creativity and innovation are not topics that you could learn just by reading a book. You have to do things. You've got to convert it from your brain to your fingertips and put things up on a wall, you know, the stickies on the wall approach. And then we're going to talk a lot about how do you make this happen in an organization? How do you sustain the uh, ability of an organization to, to remain innovative and creative? Next slide. The learning objectives, do you have that up there, Daniel? Yes, yes sir. Okay. My main goal for this course, and you could read the learning objectives, but my main goal is to unleash the uh, participants' creativity in the room, and actually, if we, when we do this online, also unleash it in, in, in the comfort of your home so that you could actually be able to come up with new concepts, new ideas, new approaches to solving problems, new ways of coming up with products or services, and also in, develop the plan to actually bring this into your organization and actually make it work. Um, again, it's theoretically, all of us could become creative and be very innovative and come up with wonderful ideas, but the problem we face is how do we make it actually happen in a workplace that may discourage uh, innovation and creativity? Um, a very famous philosopher, Machiavelli, when he talked about uh, having to work with uh, the government of Venice and the church, one of his quotes, and I'll have to paraphrase it, was that anyone who introduces something new into an established organization will be met with hostility, anger, and fear. And that is part of what we have to learn to overcome. So that's what we plan to cover in this course. Let's go to day one. Okay. Yeah, hold on a second. Come on in. We have someone knocking at the door. Come on in. It's open. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, they, someone delivered all the material. Good, okay. The first day we're gonna spend a, kind of an overview of what is creativity, what is innovation, why is it important to your organization. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the organizations that are highly successfully and as innovative companies, people like Disney, uh, Google, 3M, uh, IDEO, and others. And how do they create this climate, this uh, concept where our organization values the creativity and innovation of the individual employees? And we'll start on the creative process and start learning some of the tools in day one. Um, and the next day, on day two, we're gonna get into some of the advanced methods. I'm sure all of you are familiar with tip, the typical process of brainstorming, which we'll cover quickly. But we're gonna get into alternatives to brainstorming. There are other methodologies out there. Um, in Asia, the Japanese particularly have created a whole series of new methods uh, for brainstorming. One of them is called a lotus blossom approach developed by Matsushita Industries. Others were developed by NHK, the, uh, the giant uh, telecommunications company in Japan. And these are methodologies that particularly work well when you have introverts, engineers, scientists, or people that are not likely to, in a brainstorming session, throw ideas up on the wall. They are more reticent about doing that. 
And so some of these Asian techniques allow us to be able to take from our introverts, get their good ideas. So we're going to get into some of the alternative techniques. There's a technique called Scamper, uh, another called the Bono Six Learning Hats that I'll show you in a minute. And then we're going to get into the barriers. And these are barriers include ourself, our organization, and others. And the last thing we're going to cover on day two is how do you build a process to encourage and allow and grow an innovative culture in an organization. So let's go to the next uh, day, day three. Do you have that, Daniel? Yep, it's up right now. Okay. We're going to jump to problem solving, creative problem solving and critical thinking. And that's going to get us into how do we take, um, and again, every new product and new service um, a new ch a change in how we do our work is usually in response to a challenge. We or someone recognizes that a problem exists, and the problem could be it's not, it costs too much money, it's not fast enough, it's not cool enough, it's not sexy enough. And our, our role as problem solvers, creative problem solvers, is to come up with solutions that satisfy or delight the potential customers for the product or service. So we're going to spend quite a bit of time on various methods of problem solving, including the Kepner-Trago seven-step approach, which is very popular in the United States. We're going to look at several other approaches that are popular in other parts of the world. And then we're going to start on innovation. And as we go through each day, we're going to be working on case studies. And they could be ones that you bring physically into the room with us or online, you introduce these to your teammates and we could, we could work on actual problems or issues or areas of creativity and innovation that you want to introduce. And so at each of these sessions, we'll be actually spending most of our time doing work. Uh, I delight in watching other people work and struggle. The creative process is messy. It's not a neat process. It's not step by step. We follow the same rules every day. Uh, it's a very messy process, but it's also a lot of fun. So that's what we're going to do on day three, get through an introduction to innovation. And innovation basically is converting creative ideas into something tangible that you can show, design, build, demonstrate, prototype. And finally, in our last day, we'll talk about managing the innovation process and overcoming the barriers. Again, and the barriers are enormous. And how do you introduce an innovative culture into your company and, or into your, org, into your group? And how do you transition innovation to new products or services, which gets you ready for the next course in product development? Let's go to the next one. What is creativity? Are we on there? Yes, sir. Okay. So, Creativity, an original product of human invention or imagination. It's original, it's expressive, it's imaginative, it's groundbreaking, and it's innovative. Uh, something new. And the question I always ask my students is, how many of us are innovative? And how many of us are creative? And then I have to explain what the difference is. All of us, or most of us, are creative. We come up with new ideas. The difference is, what do you do with that idea? I, I know from myself, I'll see somebody come out with a new product, and I'll say to myself, you know, I thought of that four years ago. But the difference is, yeah, I was creative and thought of it, but I didn't do anything about it. I didn't change it. I didn't create a model. I didn't try to sell it. I didn't try to raise funds to bring it to the market. So that's the big difference. So what, let's go to the next slide. How do we get creative? And individually, we can be creative, but how do we become creative as a group? And so these are some of the topics we'll be covering in great detail and practicing. We'll work on individual creativity. How many ideas can you generate in a given period of time? Putting a group together, and how do we build on our individual ideas to create even better and bigger ideas? What are some of the techniques we can use 
And then what are the various brainstorming methods, which is probably the single um, most important tool used for innovation. Let's go to the next one, some barriers. And these again are enormous. Many of them are self-imposed. We don't want to appear foolish. In certain cultures, um, if our superior is in the room in a creative brainstorming session, it would not be appropriate for us to show off by coming up with ideas that may be better than our boss or our superior. Uh, certain societies, uh, we, we discourage individual and go more for group creativity. So there we have to modify our approach to reflect the society and the culture we have to work with. And finally, there's our organizations. Some organizations are open to new ideas. Uh, some organizations are absolutely closed to anything new that hasn't been done here before. So again, we're going to work through all of these barriers and talk about how would you in your own organization overcome these, both for yourself and for your organization. Let's go to De Bono Six Thinking Hats. This is one of my personal favorite approaches to innovative and creative thinking. And De Bono was a psychologist who came up with this idea many years ago. And the idea is that in a group, um, if everybody is the same, if we're all wildly creative without thinking about facts or barriers or logic, we'll end up with a lot of chaos. And if we have a group where everybody is logical and uh, rejects intuition, then we're going to have a group that basically will never do anything. So the idea in the Bono Six Thinking Hats is that we assume personas. And so we have six people or six personas. You could do it with three people, so you may have to wear two hats. Um, you have 10 people, you could share hats. But each hat represents a personality that you assume, a persona you assume for the brainstorming session. So the white hat represents information and facts. And that's what, that's what your role is. Just the facts, just the facts, nothing but the facts. The red hat, feelings. I feel good about that idea. Uh, that, that idea turns me off. So you're allowed, so again, we, we take turns and we rotate the hats around. So different people get to assume different personas. It allows again for uh, different personality types to assume a different role and a chance to be expressive and creative. It's one of the more popular approaches in uh, creative thinking. Let's go to the next one. And we talk about creativity and we look at who's creative. And again, if I gave you a test and I asked you these four questions, pick one of the following, four-year-old preschoolers, eight-year-old third graders, 17-year-old high school seniors, and finally, 20 to 50 year old managers and business people. Who would you pick? Very few people get the right answer. And the, the right answer is A. Um, what happens at the age of about six in most cultures and societies? At the age of six, you enter school, in some cases, kindergarten at five. From that point on, through college, graduate school, you are told that the person in the front of the room, is usually called the instructor, the teacher, the professor, has all the right answers, and that success in school is you regurgitating back to this authority standing in front the right answers. Well, after 10, 15, 20 years of this kind of schooling, you've kind of had the creativity and innovation beaten out of you. And it turns out that when you give these tests on creativity and, uh, to different age groups, preschoolers score the highest. Now, there's an interesting fact that after about the age of 55, uh, people over 55 suddenly leap up and become almost as creative as four-year-old four preschoolers. Part of it is that you reach a certain age, you no longer care about being laughed at and you don't mind people making fun of your ideas. So again, this is, um, 
And what do we talk about in the class? We're going to talk a lot about regaining our childhood because part of being creative is uh, being able to go back to the open-mindedness that we have as children that we lose after many, many years of being beaten in, uh, in our schooling. Let's go to the next slide, innovative thinking. This is the beginning of a quote by one of our great thinkers, uh, Professor Drucker at the Claremont Graduate School. He passed away a few years ago, but this is one of his quotes, and on the next slide, another part of it. Uh, Innovation will be the most single most important factor in determining America's success through the 21st century. Uh, in today's world, we cannot, as the United States and other developed nations, we cannot compete with the rest of the world on cost. Uh, everybody in the world has high quality. You can go to China, you go to Japan, you go to Malaysia, India. We can get quality products. The edge that we have is our ability to be creative and innovative and churn out new ideas and new services quicker than anybody else. And so on the next slide is the rest of the quote from Peter Drucker. And he says that, and one of the interesting things is that effective innovation, which can benefit business, and he defines effective innovation as the timely and efficient implementation of new ideas that result in significantly increased revenue and profits. For those of us that are in the business world, creativity and innovation that do not lead to process improvement, uh, improve uh, products, improve services, new products and services that did not exist before have no value. If they don't end up where we could sell it, rent it, lease it, and have people use it and pay us money. Creativity and innovation is interesting, but won't solve our problems. Let's go to the next slide. Business mantras are changing. Over the last 50, 60 years, we really have moved through um, a quite, quite a gamut of of, of movements, programs du jour. Uh, the, the big change in the 70s and 80s is the United States and other developed countries learned to be um, hot quality sensitive. We learned from our good friends in Japan through the Toyota production system how to make our cars better. Uh, we all learned how to become good with quality. And today, quality is no longer a, a competitive advantage. Everyone, you, you need good quality just to get into the game, but it won't win the game for you. Then we went through the 90s and the early 2000s, we got the concept of agile and speed and quickness. And we learned to get through our phase gate processes quicker. We learned to use agile methods to get products to the market uh, quicker. And then we went through a period of what's called EOQ, economic order quantity of one, highly customized products. Uh, personalized medicine, pharma companies actually developed medicines specifically for individuals. Uh, we do products specifically for an individual, cars, shoes, bicycles. All of these things can be productized for an economic order quantity of one. But the, the, the mantra now is innovate and commercialize. Come up with a new idea and get it into the marketplace as quickly as possible uh, before somebody else does. Let's go to the next one, impacts on innovation. There are a lot of areas where innovation uh, helps our companies and we can innovate how we're organized. We can change our organization structure to become uh, more competitive break through all those silos of organization structure that we learn about in our human resource program. Um, we could innovate how we conduct business and you look at all of the businesses that have come out of, of web-based and out of the smartphone, things that would not have existed without these uh, breakthrough technologies like Airbnb and Uber and Lyft. Um, the whole concept of Amazon would not have existed without the invention of the internet. So again, we, our business innovation coming from breakthrough technology, 
We can innovate in how we produce our products. We can innovate in marketing. Uh, in process, again, Lean Six Sigma is the single most popular innovative product um, process innovation. But I have to warn everyone, and I have good friends who are Lean Six Sigma practitioners, is that you can go too far. You could lean an organization out to the point where there's no wiggle room for innovation. You could Six Sigma things to the point where there, there are no, um, <laughs> there's no slack. And some people think that's a good thing. Well, innovation and creativity, are, again, are messy. Try to put an ISO process, an ISO 9001 process in research. How do you quantify and document the thinking process, the, the, the new development process of creativity? Very difficult. Let's go to the next one. What prevents the magic of innovation from happening? We look at other organizations and we say, how did Google get to be innovative? How does uh, Apple retain its innovation? So one way is to look at what do they do? And so we're going to cover in the course, how does Apple hire? What's their hiring structure? What does um, Google look for in terms of the kinds of people it wants to hire? The Disney Imagineering approach for hiring. Because that part of it is creating a structure, an organization, and getting in the kinds of people. And when they, you talk to people at the Disney organization, they talk a lot about diversity. But they don't talk as much about diversity as we do here at the university in terms of diversity of age, race, color, uh, national origin. They talk in terms of diversity of the thinking process. They want group people who think differently. You can have people from 10 different countries, and if they all have the same background and think the same way, you're not going to get creativity and innovation. So let's go to the next slide. We'll talk about some of the barriers that we'll be covering a lot. One is very typical, rejection of new ideas from a junior person. What do you know, kid? You've only, you know, you're only 22 years old. Uh, I've been here for 30 years. I know more than you. Uh, many organizations, again, not wanting to listen to new approaches. And how do you overcome an organization's not invented here complex? Uh, if we didn't do it, then it can't be any good. A lot of large, very large companies, these are major barriers that need to be broken through. Let's go to the next one, the next hurdle. And this is one I heard from a, a good friend at British Petroleum. They opened up what they call crowdsourcing, and they have over probably 600,000 employees, and they opened up um, a portal for ideas, and the ideas flowed in. But the problem now is, how do you filter them? How do you evaluate them? How do you come up with a way of knowing out of all these tens of thousands of ideas flowing in, which ones are worth pursuing? So that's one of the hurdles that we're going to be, be discussing. Next slide. Um, again, the classic for this one is the uh, Xerox uh, Palo Alto Research Center Park. Very famous lab up in Palo Alto for Xerox. And they came up with almost every new idea in Silicon Valley. Uh, Microsoft took Windows from them. Sun Microsystems took the uh, concept of, works, of workstations. The GUI interface came from their facility, the mouse. All of these things were developed at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center. But their evaluation process at the front end was, what does this have to do with copy machines? And if the answer was nothing, the lab would say, we, we're not, when, the rest of Xerox is not interested in your ideas. So the lab gave away fantastic ideas to all of Silicon Valley because, again, of the Xerox process. So you have to be very careful that you have a, a wide enough bandwidth for these new ideas to take into the marketplace. The next hurdle. We don't have a way to tap into the thinking of employees, partners, and users. Um, again, one solution is to open up a crowdsourcing portal in an organization, but then you have that other problem of filtering all the information. So again, these are real barriers that 
companies tell us that they, we need to overcome in order to be able to utilize the innovation and creativity of our, our workforce. This is a funny one, the next one. If we move to I don't have time to be innovative, uh, Daniel? We're, the, we're there. Okay. Uh, and everybody points to Google for this. And I, I get a okay, I've spent time at various Google facilities. And Google has a very, very um, unique outlook. They give employees up to 20%, it's, I think 10 to 20% of their own time on the job where they could think of all kinds of innovative and creative things in addition to their real work. And that sounds great. But if you ask the average Google employee, what is the, how, what's your work week? They put in on an average about 65 hours. So, so Google's giving them back about 10 of those 65 hours. So it's really not costing Google very much. But again, what, what I have found is that if I give people the opportunity to be innovative, they, and if it's something that they want to do, it's something that it's their idea, they figure out a way of getting it done within the time they have and also getting their other work done. We have to set aside time to be innovative. Uh, personally, I find the mornings are best. So we, we allow our workers maybe an hour in the mornings to just be creative and innovative, but we still require them to get their work done. Let's go to the next one. And where do I go to get exchange thinking with other innovation leaders? And we have all kinds of websites um, and chat rooms that we will provide to our students um, where you can share ideas with other people all over the world in terms of trying out creative and innovative ideas for new businesses. Uh, we have there's all kinds of workshops uh, throughout the world where people are sitting down and spending time. And you know, the thing, the things like the TED conferences, they get into a lot of this kind of stuff. So it goes all the way from small groups and in, in organizations all the way up to large multinational corporations. This I think is the last one. Uh, we have no way to track innovation, progress, or success. One of the things we've, we've tried to come up with is the metrics for innovation. How, does it, how do you prove to your management, especially to the chief financial officer, that innovation has a payoff in terms of financial return on the investment in labor and materials? Because again, most organizations, if there is no return on investment or some way of calculating a return to show value, it won't be approved. So we have a series of metrics, and some of them are very common, uh, patents issued, uh, the number of uh, the, the sales of products that are less than two years old, all of these things, and there are many others that allow an organization to measure its innovative quotient. And we actually have an innovation index uh, it's a global innovation index, uh, and it measures about 15 characteristics of a, of a global economy. The amount of money spent in research and development, patents, intellectual property value, uh, graduate degrees, all kinds of uh, factors that when you add them up, you can actually totem pole the countries in the world. I think the United States is now number five. Uh, I believe Singapore is, is near the top. Um, we, we were once, I think, third. We've dropped to, we dropped to eight. We're back to five now. Um, so we're one of the most innovative countries in the world. Some final thoughts. Um, one of the ways of in innovation, and it's a quote from um, one of the great Nobel Prize winners from Hungary who talked about that innovative people can see the same things that other people think and see, but come out with different conclusions. Einstein also had a kind of a, one of his expressions related to that. that. We have to look at things, we have to analyze our environment, we have to analyze the problem, we have to think of solutions, 
We have to be able to synthesize multiple approaches, bring it all together, and reframe it. Uh, again, Airbnb is a good example. Uh, bed and breakfast have been around a long time. The internet's been around a long time. But somebody, and the idea of, of apartment or home sharing has been around even a longer time, where people from different countries would, would allow people to come and live at their homes while they're on vacation. Well, it took a combination of the internet, the B&B &B concept, uh, the vacation sharing, all together, and somebody came up with the concept of Airbnb. And the same with uh, Uber or Lyft. It's taking existing things and looking at it a different way. So that's what we'll be working on during our involvement in this program, in this course and the whole program. And again, the idea is that new ideas can come from any experience. The more experiences you have, the more likely you are to come up with new ideas. So with that, um, we'll entertain questions. <clears throat> and um, I'll be available. My, my email will be posted so that you can contact me directly regarding the course or the program that we plan to uh, kick off over the next few months. And with that, I'm finished, Daniel. Thanks. Thanks so much, Marty. Excellent presentation, really compelling ideas. Um, in regard, I have a question, actually. In regard, you mentioned uh, some, some uh, lean innovation. And at, at what point do you think, or, or rather, what signals the stopping point? I mean, does, does a minimum viable product uh, signal the stopping point for innovation so you don't, like, pigeonhole your idea? Does that make sense? Well, the concept of an MVP or the minimal viable product is to get something into the marketplace quickly mm -hmm. without all the bells and whistles that most people don't really need or want. Um, the, the key in lean is... Um, when you try to lean out a process, you're taking out all of the waste. Well, when you're being creative and innovative, you don't know what the waste is. Uh, one, of the, one of the great innovative companies was brought to its knees by a Lean Six Sigma practitioner. The company was called 3M. Hmm. For many generations, they were considered the most innovative company in the United States. Well, they brought in a new chairman who came from General Electric who was a Lean Six Sigma expert. And he basically told them that all research and development, pro all research projects must show a potential payback before anybody could work in them. Well, if you work in research, you don't, you don't know which idea is going to have payback. And the idea is that you may try out five or ten things in the hope that one or two will make money for you. So when people come in and do ISO 9001 or lean, where you want to be able to document that everything you're doing is not muda or not waste, that works fine once you have in the product development phase where you're actually building, designing and building the product, but not in the thinking phase. Thinking is messy. And so trying to apply any of these process methodologies during the creative part of the process is usually counterproductive and basically eliminates new thinking. Uh, again, the pharmaceutical industry went through this when they pursued ISO 9001 and to applied it to their R and the research part, the discovery part of research. They basically shut down their research labs and had to go to outside researchers in order to get new products into the pipeline. So again, we have to be very careful. If a little lean is good, is more lean better? It's the same argument you have. If two aspirins go cure your headache, what will the whole bottle do to you? So again, we have to be very, very careful regarding uh, process, these process methodologies and their impact on the front end of the creative process. And speaking of the, the front end of the creative process and building on what you just said, is is a potential barrier to the creative process, the process itself, as in like you can be creative up into a point and then you have to move forward with your idea? Yeah, one of the things that we use in the class that I'm going to introduce to students to is a company called IDEO. They're probably the most innovative uh, product development company in the world. They're basically, they're up in Palo Alto and they have offices around the world. And they 
have a process and it, it's called organized chaos. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds compelling. Well, it, 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 well, their approach really works. Uh, they were they were very popular on a, um, a 60 minute segment a number of years ago when they actually showed how they develop new products. But what basically is is time limits. We can be wildly creative up into this point, at which point we must narrow down the options to five viable options. Mm -hmm. We now can be wildly creative and innovative until this ch uh, choke point where we have to now come up with one idea that we can take to the marketplace. So again, their approach, and they actually call it, is organized chaos. Excellent. We'll have to look that up, organized chaos. Uh, well, I think that is it uh, in terms of the questions. If anyone listening to this has a question for Marty or myself, uh, be sure to send that our way. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw up the contact information on the screen right now. Oh, it's a little bit glitchy on that slide. I apologize. But you get the general idea. There's my director's contact information, uh, mine as well. In case you want to send me a postcard, there's a snail mail address. And be sure to check out our, our website, uh, as per usual, uh, unex.uci.edu. Um, again, if you have any questions uh, regarding the content of Marty's presentation, uh, go ahead and send those our way, uh, and we'll get those answered. Um, thanks so much, Marty, for being with us. Uh, an excellent uh, presentation. Really uh, interested in that class. Okay. Well, hopefully we can get some of our own staff to take it so we can try to be more creative and innovative within our own organization. I fully agree. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks. Thank you, everyone, for uh, listening to this presentation. If you're listening it as a recording, thank you, uh, and uh, have a wonderful day. Thanks again, Marty. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.